Alright, continuing with this series of videos, um, playing and commenting on the information provided by MN MIT as a description of um, physics, something like that. Anyway, lecture something or other, um, kind of gone cyclotrons and such, I think. <laughs> Don't remember. Anyway, okay, find the page and play the video. Maybe a little bit more volume. Seems a little low in the last video, but we'll see. Uh, Alright, so I skipped the uh, lecture 12, which was a review for the exam. And uh, the first minute or so of this video, I, um, you know, it was just review of the tests or something. Today I'm going to uncover a whole new world for you. And you will see how 802 comes in there in a very natural way. The Lorentz force F is the charge times the cross product <coughs> of the velocity of that charge and the B field that the charge experiences. If I have here. All right, velocity is another word for voltage, sort of. A positive charge plus Q, and it has a velocity V in this direction, and the magnetic field would be uniform and coming out of the blackboard. So you could say pressure even, uh, I would say pressure. <laughs> so it's released at a certain pressure, it has a certain velocity because of that pressure, and then encounters uh, a magnetic field, which I think should be described better than just saying B. Um, you know, clearly a magnetic field is north and south. It has components. Um, I don't know exactly why he just says B. It just doesn't say enough. There's going to be a force on this charge according to this relationship. And the force is then like so. Perpendicular to V, perpendicular to B. In this case, the charged particle is going to go around in a circle. The Lorentz force cannot change the speed, cannot change the kinetic energy, because the force is always perpendicular to the velocity, but it can change the direction of the velocity. And so what you're going to see is that the charged particle will go around into a perfect circle. Um, so I don't know exactly, you know, where, how they do this idea that somehow I would argue that you have to have magnetic field around the entire circumference to create a circumference uh, a repulsive magnetic field so I, I guess I don't exactly understand how you get this orbiting freely outside of a magnet I don't see anything that demonstrates the capacity to do that so I don't um, I don't get how this analogizes to reality exactly if the magnetic field is constant throughout. And the radi All right, constant throughout. So I guess he's implying that this B field is always exposed <laughs> around that circumference. I don't know. Um, uh, it's so arbitrary to my understanding that I can't really uh, help. <laughs> you know, is it doesn't. You, you just can't put like a a charge here and have a charge here moving and say this charge will go around in circles because this charge is here so it's just the way it's illustrated it's incomprehensible the result of this circle can very easily be calculated using some of our knowledge of 802 the force is qvb because i chose b also perpendicular to v and so there is no sign the sign of the angle between them is one and this now has to be the centripetal force that we encountered in 801, which is mv squared divided by r, m now being the mass of this particle. And so you'll find now that r equals mv divided by qb. And this, by the way, I want to remind you, is the momentum of that particle. Hmm. Yes, mass times velocity is um, force, energy. <laughs> yes. If you look at this equation, it's sort of pleasing. If uh, the charge is high, then the Lorentz force is high, so the radius is small. If the magnetic field is high, 
the Lorentz force is high, so the radius is small. If the mass of the particle is high, there is a lot of inertia, and so it is very difficult to make it go around, so to speak, so a very high mass, you expect a very high radius. And so that looks all intuitively quite pleasing. Let's do a numerical example. I take a proton, P stands for proton, and I take a 1 MeV proton. The same I took during my test review. 1 MeV means that the kinetic energy is 1 MeV is the charge times the potential difference over which this proton was accelerated. In this case, delta V would be 1 million volts. And this now equals 1 half times the mass of that proton times the velocity squared. So like a uh, electron gun, if you could make a proton gun, um, that's all you're really doing. You're just reversing the charge essentially and the proton will go the opposite way. So the cathode and the anode are reversed and then protons will move like electrons would move in an electron gun. Um, the catch being um, that this acceleration, this movement, is entirely dependent on the force pushing it. And so the question is how far can you go before you run out of force <laughs> if you don't keep supplying force? And obviously you can't keep supplying force in a circle. In this case, if I have a 1 MeV, so there's a million volts, you will find that this is 1.6 times 10 to the minus 13 joules. I gave you there the charge of the proton, you multiply that by a million, and this is the energy. And so now you can calculate the velocity, because you know the mass of the proton, I gave you that too there, and so you will find exactly what we found. So the energy is essentially a definition of how much energy it took to move it. Because that's what the energy is. It had to be pushed. It didn't go anywhere for free. It went somewhere because you hit it with that much energy, enough energy to move it. And some of that energy didn't move it. So you'll take more energy than you're going to get out of it to get it to move. <laughs> So there's a lot of waste in what you're going to have to put in when you put in that million volts. Um, a lot of those, a lot of the current won't be hitting that specific proton. During my test review, 1.4 times 10 to the 7 meters per second, which is 5% of the speed of light. Comfortably low, so we don't have to make any relativistic corrections. If this proton now enters a magnetic field B, which is one Tesla, then by using the equation you have up there, you know the mass of the proton, we just calculated the velocity, you know the charge of the proton, and you know the B field, you will find that R is 0.15 meters. Alright, so that would be the, the B field is going to define how far from the B field. So when he said B and he put a circle around, maybe that just does mean a B field from, a, you know, a circle of magnetism. Um, because that's the only way you're going to get this to work. Uh, and the, so now we have the radius is the radius of the uh, circumference at that speed with that much magnetism. So the magnet's going to decide, the distance from the magnet's going to decide essentially this radius. Mm. Largely. It's 50 centimeters. So just a numerical example. It is more common, or at least often done, to eliminate out of that equation there the velocity and replace it by the potential difference, capital V, over which we accelerate these particles. And so, what you can do, you can replace this V by using the equation I have there, the one-half mv squared. So we have that one-half mv squared equals Q times delta V, but I will write for that just a capital V. And I substitute this V now in here. And so I no longer see the velocity, but I now see this potential difference. In the case of that proton, this V will be a million. And you will find then that R is then the square root of 2m times that capital V divided by Q B squared. 
So the two equations. So pretty much what I said is the voltage is what's doing all the work. <laughs> that, of course, the same physics, but it's a different representation. If you put in for V now 10 to the 6, mass of the proton, charge of the proton, and one Tesla field, of course you find exactly the same point 0.15 meters. Now this is all nice and dandy, but this works as long as the speed is much smaller than the speed of light. If that's no longer the case, then we have to apply special relativity, and that is not part of this course. Yes, well all the gimmick is, is that you just know it can't go the speed of light, and you know that most of the confinement on that speed will be happening at as you approach the speed of light is where you'll get most of the correction for the speed of light so that's the limiting factor and it doesn't really become relevant until you're going 90 percent of the speed of light so none of those none of that uh, obligation to correct for the inability of you to push something with a force that's only the speed of light to the same speed that it's the force is applying which means that the force has to somehow affect every bit of the thing um, at equilibrium at the same speed that it's going which wouldn't be pushing anymore <laughs> so you can sort of theoretically understand why a force can't possibly push something faster than it's going but I would like to briefly touch upon that today I can show you how things go sour because suppose we have a 500 kilo electron volt so that means that in this equation here the V is 500,000 the Q is the charge of the electron M is now the mass of the electron and if I apply that equation I find that V is 4.2 times 10 to the 8 meters per second and that is larger than the speed of light so, that's so he's constricting the orbit by applying more magnetic field at a lower voltage or so lower speed the same magnetic field so it's essentially saying I've increased the amount of the magnetic field either way could have accomplished the same task of reducing the orbit it's clearly not possible the actual speed if you make relativistic corrections is 2.6 times 10 to the 8 meters per second and although I don't expect you to be able to make those relativistic corrections, I will make them today, and you will see why I have to, and I want to show you that, in fact, this is not all that difficult. So I, I would argue that the reason why you can't push matter, the speed of light, is because the matter is essentially made of the same force in another form, and you can't, you know, you'd have to have every bit of the matter moving in exactly the same direction so everything that's made out of would have to be moving the speed of light in a straight line in a direction and therefore it couldn't be matter anymore it couldn't have pieces g doing something else because all of their time would have to be devoted to one thing going a straight line and, and so then it just becomes a beam of light so the matter is converted into a beam of light if you try to make it go faster than the speed of light or as fast as the speed of light it just turns into light. You can't push light very easily. Or at all. Even though I will not hold you responsible for these equations. So what I have here is now kinetic energy is again QV. That's not changing. But it's no longer one half mv squared. But it is gamma minus one times mc squared. And gamma is defined there. It's called the Lorentz factor. And so if you know now for the electron that capital V is 500,000, you can calculate what gamma is from the first equation, and then you go to the second equation. You right, gamma would just be the typical uh, x plus y divided by x times y thing that creates uh, 1 minus x divided by y, or whatever it is. The, the simple thing that prevents it ever going from a number larger than 1. Find what the speed is, and you will see then that you never find the speed larger than the speed of light. And so we now have to make a correction also for the radii, and those corrections become, again, relatively easy, 
This now requires a factor gamma, and you see that on the upper blackboard there. And this 2 now has to be replaced by gamma plus 1, and then everything is okay. So I don't expect you to... So gamma is just a point eight five or point nine two or point whatever. It's just a, a factor by which you reduce the number, frankly, arbitrarily, based on Lorenz bullshit. You know this, but I don't want you to think that all these relativistic corrections come out of the blue, nor do I want you to think that it is very difficult. It really is. They do come out of the blue, but whatever. The equations are extremely straightforward. So I want to show you now the, some of the results that we just discussed the 1 MeV uh, proton and the 500 keV electron. This is on the web. You can click on lecture supplements and you can make yourself a hard copy. So here you see the kinetic energy, 1 MeV proton. Notice the speed that we calculated there is non-relativistic. Gamma is very close to 1. You don't have to make a correction. And in a 1 Tesla field, you get a radius of 15 centimeters, but we just calculated. If you go to a 50 MeV proton, you're sort of on the borderline between relativistic and non-relativistic. It's still non-relativistic enough. And if it is non-relativistic, you can clearly see here. So 50 million volts. Insane amount. But anyway, um, obviously they go gigavolts now or whatever, but uh, a lot of voltage. That the radius goes with the square root of capital V. And for a 50 MeV, capital V is 50 million. And for 1 MeV, capital V is 1 million. And since it goes with the square root of V, you expect roughly the radius to be the square root of 50 times larger, which is 7. And indeed, you see that. So you see, from 15 centimeters, the radius goes to about 1 meter. Um, here is our 500 kV. Well, I mean, it's 50 times more voltage. You would think it'd be 50 times bigger rather than 7 times bigger. But okay, I understand. Inverse square. The electron. And notice that I did the calculation correctly. This is relativistically corrected. Now you get the 2.6 times 10 to the 8 meters per second by applying the formalism that you see there. I will leave this here throughout this lecture because I will return to this several times. I want to show you a acute demonstration. I have an uh, electron gun here. And the electron gun... Oh, this ought to be good comes like so, but this is the velocity of the electrons. I put a minus sign there to remind you that they are electrons. If electrons go in this direction, the current goes in that direction. And so if now I have a magnetic field... Uh, nonsense, but whatever. <laughs> this current going in opposite directions. Which, um, let's assume the magnetic field is in the blackboard. This is B. Then I cross B is the direction of the force. I is in this direction. B is in the blackboard. So if I'm not mistaken, I think the force is in this direction. And so you will see that it starts to bend in this direction. If you change the direction of the magnetic field, the magnetic field is coming out of the blackboard, then the electron will go in this direction. No, so he's just saying north magnet, south magnet, I think. Because I don't think he's going to put a current inside the electron gun. So I think he's talking about a magnet. And so, you know, implying something else, I mean, it's, it, this into the board and out of the board thing is an electrical thing. It's not a magnetic thing. So he's talking about B fields going in and out, which I think is just, I think that just reinforces ideas that just shouldn't exist, that there's currents inside of magnets. Uh, 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 uh. I can show you that here. It is not too different from the distortion experiment that I did when I had the television program there and I had this strong magnet and we distorted the image. But this, of course, is a little bit more controlled. So, we're going to see the image there. You could argue that in a magnet, the black force is going, you know, the north force is going in a direction and that is essentially voltage. But the south, the proton force is doing the same thing, but that's not a technically a voltage because that doesn't affect the electron. So, you know, this is where it kind of falls apart. There's not, there's not an equal correlate to what we see as phenomenon. That is, there's no proton-photon.
there's only electron photons. Photons that affect electrons, not photons that affect protons. And we want to make it quite dark in the room. Mm -hmm. And turn on the electron gun. So you see the electron gun, it strikes a fluorescent screen. And that's how you can see it. All right, well, pretty old kind of version. So, uh, analyzing it. So the beam comes out, so you got your two ends, so it's, that's the voltage. The black ends are, you have a voltage across them, so 500 mil, um, million volts or whatever, so obviously it's much lower than that, but the point is, is to get anything to happen, you have to create a potential difference, a voltage difference. That's where the little bits want to go, one end to the other end and the electrons are getting pushed along for the ride, so to speak. Um, so <laughs> it has a little flange that deflects the beam so you can see it down against the fluorescent screen. That's why it's green. So it's a fluorescent screen and the beam has been bent to hit the screen. And there's there's a little bit of green at the end, but that would have to be a light reflection off the screen, so that's just fooling you. The beam itself goes to the from the cathode to the anode, anode to cathode. I don't know why I can't get that one right. I have to write it down somewhere. <laughs> but anyway, so it's all clear. You really doesn't see it. You won't see anything unless you force the electrons to collide with something. So we're only seeing the collisions, we're not seeing the real thing, the real photons and the real, not photons, but the real force bits and the electrons. We're not seeing them, we're just seeing their impact on a screen. And I have here a bar magnet, and if I hold the bar magnet behind it, then I can create more or less situations like this. I can flip over the magnet and then the direction of bending should change. So here I come with the magnet. All right, so I was right about that. All right, so this is just like the the big magnet thing again. You, the, the conductor can't turn or something. So the electrons are deflecting up. <sighs> They're deflecting out, I would think, away. But it doesn't really matter. Uh, I mean, I have to think on whether up or away is the same thing. It depends on how he's approaching the magnet, I suppose. If he's coming from above or coming from below, would decide whether the beam goes up or whether the beam goes down, I think. And you see, curve up the electrons. I turn the magnet over, and I come in again, and they curve down. Very straightforward. All right, it is straightforward, but I guess I would move the magnet up and down more to see if if this up and down thing is irrelevant. It just has to do with whether it's south facing and it's attracting uh, or north facing and repelling. Hmm. See we're back to the turn thing, you know, this field being created this way and stuff is moving this way. Um, but, yeah, I'll, I'll do some thinking on it, but, see, I, I just, I, I would wish there was a little more to the experiment. That would be simple. There is a fantastic way in physics that we can separate isotopes from one and the same element. If we, for instance, take uranium, then uranium, when you find it, to 99.3%, uranium-238. That means it has 92 protons, otherwise it wouldn't be uranium, and it has 146 neutrons. 99.3%. 0.7% is uranium-235, again 92 protons, otherwise it wouldn't be uranium, but only 143 neutrons, and that you'll find in nature 
4.7%. So you go to a chemist and you give a chemist a little bit of uranium and you say, would you please separate these two isotopes for me? And he, of course, would laugh at you and he would say, go fly a kite because the chemical properties are exactly the same for the two because uranium is uranium. Neutral uranium here has 92 electrons and neutral uranium here has 92 electrons. So there's no way that they could separate those. Uh, well, there might be a way. He's just not defining the way. Um, I mean, obviously, uh, the curates did it with radium, so there must be a way. <laughs> and I will show you now how they can be separated with what we call a mass spectrometer. You heat the uranium so that it ionizes. Let's assume it's ionized one, so it loses one electron. So it's positively charged with one unit charge, one of those charges that you see here. And we now accelerate it over a certain potential difference. So these uranium atoms, the 235 and the 238, get a certain speed. And they come in here with this speed, V. So they're positively charged. And let's assume that we have a magnetic field that is uniform and that is in this direction. It comes out of the blackboard. So what will happen is that these charged particles, which are positively charged now, one unit charge, are going to go around the circle and hit here. This is the radius. But if you look here at these equations, so you will see that the radius is proportional with the square root of the mass of the particle. And the mass... Well, I can buy that half circle thing, but, um, you know, I, I'm just wondering about the full circle thing. Well, whatever. More research required. The mass of 238 is 1.2% larger than the mass of 235. And so it's 1.2% larger since we have the square root there. You see here the square root. We accelerate them over the same potential difference, so this one doesn't change. This is the only thing that changes. So then you expect an 0.6% change in radius. And so the 238 will end up here. I exaggerate it very highly. And the 235 will end up here. The 238 has a larger radius because it has a larger mass. And you see that here. There's no change in B, there's no change in Q, and there's no change in capital V. We accelerate them over the same potential difference. And so it... All right, so you have to ionize them with essentially vaporizing them so you can put them through this process as individual little atoms. And so, yes, that's got to be a little bit tedious. If the radius, for instance, were one meter of this mass spectrometer, then the difference here, remember this is 2R, the difference would come out to be about 1.2 centimeters. And so you have a collector here where you collect your 238 nuclei, atoms, and here you collect your 235. And that is the idea behind a mass spectrometer. Why did I choose this particular example? Well, this example changed our world and it made history. Uranium-235 was needed by the Americans to build an atomic bomb to end the Second World War. This, is, this was done under the famous Manhattan Project. And Ernest Lawrence of Berkeley built mass spectrometers which were able to separate uranium-235 from 238. In the beginning, it went very slowly, about 100 micrograms per day. But a few kilograms was required for an atomic bomb. And they finally managed to get up to one gram per day. And in combination with other separation techniques, such as the gas diffusion techniques, which I will not discuss here now, they managed to get a few kilograms, and they dropped the bomb on Hiroshima on August oh. 6, 1945, and three days later, the bomb was dropped on Nagasaki. The Japanese surrendered, and it was the end of world. Yeah, it's not exactly the story, but fine, whatever. Yes, we decided mass murder civilians. <laughs> yeah, to end the war. Real classy. World War II. It's a good thing that there are many peaceful applications nowadays of mass spectrometers, particularly in the medical area. People sometimes require radiation, and they need radiation from a particular radioactive isotope, but you don't want the other isotopes from the same element, and so you separate them then with a mass spectrometer. It's a whole industry, a very important industry. And I would like to address the issue, how do you accelerate protons? Oh, good. Back to physics to extremely high speeds, almost approaching the speed of light. And that is also something for which Ernest Lawrence is credited. In the early days, it was done in a cyclotron, 
which I will describe to you now. The cyclotron consists of a chamber, which is called a D. This is one D, and here's another D. These are conducting chambers. If you look from the side, it would look like so. This is the left chamber, and this is the right chamber, and all of this is in vacuum. And let's assume that we have a magnetic field coming out of the board, like so. All right, so we have a magnetic field coming up from the bottom in the form of a north or south. And that's going to make stuff spin this way. I don't know. It doesn't work for me, but okay, let's just play along. Let's revisit our 1 MeV proton. Suppose I release in this chamber here a 1 MeV proton, and I know the speed with which it comes out, because the 1 MeV proton had a speed, oh, you still see it there, 1.4 times 10 to the 7 meters per second. We also know that in a 1 Tesla field, let's make this 1 Tesla, that the radius is going to be 15 centimeters. You see it up there. So what is this proton going to do? It's going to do this. But when it gets there, a potential difference is introduced between these two Ds. So that this is low po high potential and this is a low potential. And so you're going to get an electric field now. In this so the proton does its half orbit thing. It's, I would argue, is slowing down. And now they're going to boost its speed by having it jump a gap. You know, just go through the electron gun process. And then they'll gun it again and gun it again gap in this direction and so this proton is being accelerated and let's suppose that the difference in potential is 20 kilovolts then this proton will gain in electric in kinetic energy it will gain kinetic energy 20 kilo electron volts that's the way electron volt is, is defined and so you start off with one MeV so when it has crossed this gap it is now 1.02 MeV 20 keV more the radius now is larger. If capital V is 2% higher, and I go to this equation, then the radius is 1% higher. And so when it comes out here, and it makes a circle, the radius now is 1% higher than 15 centimeters. All right, 20 kilovolts. I don't know how he says that's 1% when it's 1.2. Okay, right, so it started off as 1%. And now you're adding 0.2. Okay, so you didn't add very much. And uh, the assumption is the proton had, didn't lose any speed. But when it gets to this part of the D, this potential difference is reversed, and so the electric field is again in this direction, in the direction of the proton, and so it is accelerated again by 20 kilo electron volts. Now the radius, of course, is even larger. And so very gradually, every time that it reaches the gap, the potential difference is changed in direction to accelerate the proton. And so it gradually spirals out then to the largest radius uh, that you have. So doing one full rotation, it gains 20 kilo electron volt once and 20 kilo electron volt twice. So it gains 40 kilo electron volts. And so the electric fields are doing the work. They accelerate the particles. The magnetic fields cannot accelerate. Magnetic fields can change the direction, but they can do no work on the particles. So the magnetic field... Nah, I still... It's just... A, you know, saying it's the wrong way to say it. It means work when you move something. <laughs> so, um, the work is just irrelevant to velocity. Uh, it's just a change in direction. Um, so, I'm still stuck with the idea. Like we, I could see how it could accelerate to a peak you know, obviously acceleration always takes time, and then you get that peak velocity at some point, like, you know, the midpoint of the donut, you know, the one quarter of the donut, the, the horizontal, and then it would decline in velocity, and then you speed it up again and speed it up again, but you're still, I think there's got to be losses in this system. I, I don't know whether he's just averaging the losses out or just pretending they don't exist for the sake of the discussion. It's confined the particles. 
let's assume we go 1,225 full rotations. During each rotation, the kinetic energy increased by 40 keV. And so if you multiply the two, then you see now that the kinetic energy of this proton increased by 49 million electron volts. Because it went 1,225 times all the way around. And so now you have 49 MeV plus the 1 MeV that you started with. So now you have a 50 MeV proton. You see the second line there? There we have that 50 MeV proton that I discussed with you earlier. In a one Tesla field, now the radius is one meter. So if this unit had a radius of one meter, that would be fine. By that time, it would be all the way. All right, so it's, like I said, 50 times more uh, faster. You know, and yet it's only uh, from whatever, 10 centimeters, 15 centimeters to one meter, which is only whatever, seven times he says more, which um, obviously means there's got to be some losses in there somewhere. The, the circumference of this unit. What is remarkable and, no, and not intuitive that the time to go around, as long as we don't have to make relativistic corrections, that the time for a proton to go around is independent of its speed, not so intuitive. And you can see that very easily, because the time to go around is 2 pi r divided by its speed. You see, the radius is proportional to v. And so the time itself is independent of v because r itself is linearly proportional with the speed, and so that cancels. And so you'll find now that the time to go around is simply 2 pi times the mass of that particle divided by qb. And if you correct relativistically, then you have to multiply by gamma. But if you stay non-relativistic, then it's independent of the speed of the protons. Yeah, sorry, I wasn't paying much attention. <laughs> still still stuck on where this magnetic field is and what's producing it. It's my understanding the magnets go around the circumference. Um, but that's just my understanding. Obviously, if you have a variable radius, that's not going to work. I mean, I know the big ones do it that way, but that's like they have a... They keep it a constant radius and change the amount of magnetism to keep it in the same path. But I don't know how the magnets are being applied here and I, I think they've got to be around the cyclotron all the way around. So if we stick to this particular case of a 1 MeV proton that became a 50 MeV proton going around 1225 times, this time to go around once is only 66 nanoseconds. So this is 6.6 .6 times 10 to the minus 8 seconds. Give you some feeling of how fast all this is going. So if you go around 1225 times, that would take only 80 microseconds. So in 80 microseconds, does all of this occur? And that means you have to switch this field twice per full rotation. Make sure that the E field is in this direction, but when the proton comes here, the E field has to be in that direction. And so the switching frequency, easily be calculated, becomes about 30 million times per second, about 30 megahertz. And all of that takes place in 80 microseconds, and you create one MeV protons, you turn them into two. All right, so the other catch to this is, you see it just says one MeV protons. The other catch to this is that it's not a single proton. So the, the point I would make is the protons themselves have the you know, pressure between them. And so you're pushing a string of protons, which means essentially that the force takes time to get through the protons, because the protons are being moved. And so the speed is the difference between what the speed of light would be for the same radius would be telling you mm, probably how many protons you're pushing. Probably. 
how big a, a difference there is. But it is sort of like pushing on a stick or pushing on something solid because the pressure between the protons is increasing as you're hitting them. So as you hit them to push them, the pressure in between the protons is equalizing the pressure you're pushing with. So it's not the pushing pressure that maintains the velocity, it's the compression pressure between the protons. So just like, in a sense, the electron gun's doing the same thing. It's a stream of electrons, and the electrons all have pressure between them. So the voltage you're pushing them with, the electrons acquire the same pressure as the voltage you're pushing them with. 50 MeV protons. A mind-boggling concept, but it works. Quite remarkable. Now, be where we are. Oh, it's probably a good time to quit uh, for this half. Halves, I think, are better than holes because I get tired. You have to think. You, know, you have to listen. It's good not to make too many mistakes. You know, reduce the number of those. Um, so the only thing I have to work on is figuring out when he does this electric field thing, does he really mean a coil of wire? Does he mean What does he mean by circle with a B in it? Because that's not saying anything. Yeah, from my perspective, he hasn't, I didn't see the, I didn't see the lecture where he explained that, oh no, this circle with a B means it doesn't mean a magnet sitting here, it means there's a magnet all the way around this thing or something. It obviously means something because just sticking a magnet over here isn't going to make an electron do this. It just ain't going to happen. So, there's something wrong with this picture. I have to figure out what the picture is. And hopefully that'll happen <laughs> somewhere in this process. Uh, maybe I'll watch some other videos, some other lectures on, see if I can find the same subject addressed by somebody else and see if they explain it with a little bit more clarity. But anyway, um, that'll have to do for now. So, till next time, and yeah, I'm still not framed right. I don't know what is this camera. I guess it's the difference between when I'm sitting up and when I'm loafing, I guess, but I don't know. It's still not right. I move it this way. Oh, that's a little better. Yeah. Hmm. Spider making a web. Anyway. Critters. Anyway, until the next time. i probably point it down then I can slouch and get away with it. I like slouching. Slouch. I'm tired. Until next time.